Ok. Ok. Yeah, it's coming. All right, fishy folks, we're live. You're looking at Jason from Ocean Nutrition. How's everyone doing today? If you can hear me, let me know. If you can see me, let me know. All right, fishy folks, oh. we're live. You're looking at Jason uh -oh. from Ocean Nutrition. You got to turn your volume down. If you can hear me, let me know. If you can see me, let me know. Turn your volume down. Should I use a uh, my headset thing instead? You have it. Let's try that. So, how's everyone doing? Now I can't hear you, Jason. I can't hear you. This is fantastic, folks. Just keeping it real here at Michael's Fish Room. I'm good. Snake with braces. Can you hear Jason? I can't hear Jason. I can hear you guys and see you, Mike. But you can't see Jason? He's the good looking ball guy. Jason, I can't hear you. Can't hear you at all, my friend. Let's chat. Can't hear you. Sorry, folks. Talks amongst yourselves. Fishy Norway has a flower horn. His name is Walter. Hello from Norway. Hi, everyone. All right. I know you guys hear me. I only hear me. I don't hear Jason. Jason, I can't hear you. Jason, can't hear you. What'd you do? I heard you before. Can't hear you. Uh oh. So, yeah, you guys talk amongst yourselves for a minute. The topic will be the king of DIY and go. So, uh, can't hear you. No, nothing. Zero. What are you looking at now? You see me? Okay. I, I can't hear you. What did you do to your volume? Whatever you did, undo it. <coughs> and hear you. <coughs> hey, maybe uh, disconnect and try again or something, dude. I can't hear you. Nobody can hear you. Nope. Did I mute you? That would suck if I did it, right? Stand by. No, you're not muted. Oh, boy. Sorry, guys. Juan wants to know what's wrong with the king of DIY. You guys tell him for me. Jason, can't hear you. What'd you do? Oh. You're back. Juan wants to know. They're gone. What happened? Jason's gone. All right, fishy folks. Maybe Jason will be back, I hope. We're going to talk about food. There he is. No? You You're back. Juan wants to know. Are you able to hear me now, though? They're gone. I, I can hear you, but we echo now. Jason's gone. All right, fishy folks. Maybe Jason will be back, I hope. We're going to talk about food. There he so is. So you got to turn the volume down of. The I able to hear you. I can hear you, but we echo now. Jason's gone. I appreciate you. Go to the YouTube stream and turn the volume down. There so is. you gotta turn the volume down of the I able to hear you. How's that? Perfect. perfect. All right. I I think we got it. All right. All right, everyone. I think we got it. I don't watch the king anymore, but. We're going to talk about other stuff. So I'm here with Jason from Ocean Nutrition. Jason is a rep, a sales rep, and R&D guru. Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. I've uh, 
been in the aquarium hobby uh, pretty much my entire life. Uh, my dad's got fish tanks. My grandfather had fish tanks. And uh, my first job was in an aquarium shop at age 14. And I just, uh, you know, was up there so much. Uh, they just offered me a job as soon as I was uh, a legal age to work up there. So I went with my working papers and uh, that's what I did. And I worked uh, retail aquatics for uh, probably about 14 years or so. Wow. How did you get involved with Ocean Nutrition? Uh, well, after I graduated from college where I was living in uh, Arizona, I uh, decided I'd send my resume out to uh, companies in the aquarium industry. And uh, I got an interview over at San Francisco Bay Brand, who, uh, you know, is uh, acquired Ocean Nutrition in 2009. I started at uh, San Francisco Bay Brand in 2001. What did you study in college that made you get hired at San Francisco Bay Brand? It had nothing to do with what I studied in college. It just had to do with my uh, my knowledge of uh, aquariums and the aquatic industry. But I did I did study um, marketing and advertising in college, so that was did come in handy, you know. But it wasn't. It was more my knowledge of they needed someone that. Uh, could work up in the sales department and answer phones and stuff as well, you know. Gotcha. And uh, do you guys do you keep any fish now? Only fish I have now are uh, betas, um, but I uh, I do take care of my dad's fish tanks and my brother's fish tanks, and those um, you know I use uh, obviously feed ocean nutrition products and Bay Brand products whenever I get something new out of. Uh, R&D or a new product, those are the tanks that I uh, usually test them on myself because it uh, always makes it easier to talk about a product once you've used it. That's true. Speak, speaking of talking about products, my subs and people who watch my videos know I'm pretty honest with products that I review. I just did a review yesterday and uh, other people have sent me fish food and to be honest, I really like the Ocean Nutrition flake food. Not a fan of the bottom grazing wafers and some of the mixes from San Francisco Bay brand, as you and I have talked, didn't really sink or separate, but the ocean nutrition flakes, like I have cichlid flakes is what I open right now. And I have spirulina flakes too. Upstairs I have the community flakes. I really, really like them. Why don't you tell us a little bit about them? What makes them so special? Well, we use a lot of high quality ingredients, um, even though like you might see on the label that it's a fish meal, uh, fish, not all fish meals are created equal and there are different grades and different qualities of fish meals. Uh, and there's also things to look out like you want to make sure um, you have all the specs on ingredients that you're using in a product and whatnot. Uh, so we know that like the fish meals have no added uh, preservatives to them or anything like that. Uh, you know, such as like a thoxiquin, even though you may not add a thoxiquin to a product, it's possible that an ingredient that's being added to a product has a thoxiquin in it to preserve it. Um, so those are things that, that we look out for. And actually, when we went through several years ago and started the reformulation of the Ocean Nutrition Flakes, uh, after we acquired the ingredients that we wanted to use that, you know, had no preservatives or natural colorants, natural preservatives. We took each of those ingredients and besides getting the spec sheets from the manufacturers, we sent each of those ingredients out independently to independent labs to also have them tested on our own so we could just verify that we knew what we were getting. You froze. Oh, you still froze. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So you mentioned a fish meal and I'm looking at this cichlid omni flake and the first ingredient is fish meal now i've always been told fish meal is the leftover bits of whatever they've used the fish for uh, it depends there can be fish meal made from different parts of the fish some fish meals made from whole fish also the process in which the fish meal is made uh, can vary right so you know it really depends on uh you know, you can get a really cheap fish meal, which is basically the sweepings from the floor at the end of the day. Um, but you can also get fish meal that's actually made from the meat of the fish and everything. And then the process by which it's produced uh, produces a higher quality. Uh, you know, I know, for instance, like the fish meals we use have a really high protein uh, and they're also low in uh, like ash and phosphorus. And we do uh, put the on our analyses on the labels. 
We do include uh, the ash and phosphorus, even though it is not required by law. And so for those of us that have no idea what ash or phosphorus would be for or not for, why don't you explain? Well, that, you know, I don't really think ash has much of an impact on the, uh, on the fish. And that's usually uh, going to be from like if you had something like an insect or something with a lot of chitin, you'll get a higher ash level. Uh, stuff like that. But then the phosphorus, what you want to watch out for is obviously phosphorus can lead to algae problems. So if you have fish that are eating a diet that are high in phosphorus, and then that's just passing through their system, you're going to get a lot more phosphorus in your water. And depending on uh, how often or frequently you're doing water changes, you're going to get more or less of a phosphate buildup. So by starting with a product that has a low phosphate level, uh, you're automatically ahead of the game. So if I was just a regular consumer walking through a local fish store and I pick up ocean nutrition products and I see the first meal is the first ingredient is fish meal. And then I pick up another brand, Tetra, New Life Spectrum, whatever it might be. And that first ingredient is something like salmon or whatever. How do I know that the fish meal is good? Um, it's something that we just have to educate the, uh, the public with, but we also make sure that the, uh, the stores are educated as well. So if they get questioned, a lot of the stores are, um, you know, really proactive. If they see someone browsing in the food aisle or something, they'll go up and start to talk to them and talk to them about the different types of foods, uh, the benefits of the different food, uh, why some may have different ingredients or not. Um, you know, I think in general, there's been a big change in a lot of the ingredients used in fish foods. I know when I was younger, working retail, you could pick up a jar of uh, flake food for tropical fish, and you would commonly see chicken meal and blood meal in there. Isn't it? <laughs> Not too many chickens in the tropical fish are eating. Oh, the chicken of the sea. Yeah. All right, so what is dried fish protein digest? Uh, what that is, that's a, um, uh, an, an enzymatic uh, emulsification process. And what that does is that uh, the way it reduces the fish, you wind up with a really high uh, protein level in the product, and you wind up with a, a low ash and a low phosphorus. And it's a, you know they do it through a, a spray dry process as opposed to uh, like they might do it on a uh, like a heated bed or something to uh, to get the moisture out of it. But instead, they spray the uh, the fish meal into a, a dryer. And then it dries it in the air, and it's a very fine powder when it lands. So that's how we get that nice texture on on our flakes is by using uh, that fish protein digest. I like I like the fact that it's so crunchy because I'm always you know doing this so the fry can eat it and all my little guppies. So I just saw a question in the chat that uh, I was going to ask you later, but I'm going to ask you now. Yeah. What do you recommend for flower horns? Since I just got one. Well, with the flower horns, uh, depending on the size, you would either go with the uh, the cichlid omni flake or the cichlid uh, omni pellet. I mean, the pellets come in a, a small pellet and a medium pellet. And then, you know, obviously the flake, you can feed them a larger flake or a um, uh, smaller flake. And then you may also want to supplement with some frozen foods. I mean, yeah. for the frozen foods that Ocean Nutrition makes, I would recommend something like the uh, the formula VHP which is meant for fish that are you know, larger cichlids and stuff like that, your larger carnivore type fish. So speaking of frozen food, now you and I have had this discussion, but I'm not smart enough to tell people what we talked about. So if you look at flake food, it'll say crude protein minimum. This is 51%, which I love. But then if you look at frozen food, it's, it's such a low amount compared. Why? Well, it's because of the moisture. Your dry food, dry food has most of the moisture removed from it, and your frozen foods you're usually going to look around eighty something percent moisture in a frozen food. Um, and we do have that document that I uh, shared with you that should be ready soon that we'll put on our website, and I'll let you know when it's ready. But that document has an in-depth uh, explanation of the difference between the dry weight and the wet weight on fish food, but also. Right. We include in that document is we include the formula so you can take a wet weight and a dry weight put them side by side and calculate it and then get what they would be at a zero percent moisture and see how the, the protein fat fiber and everything uh, matches up side by side gotcha because you know normally if a fish was to eat something say in the wild if they're eating an insect or something like that they're eating it at a wet weight 
you know? Right. And so once you've dried it, it, it you know, it's um, not what it would be like if you had like a, you know, a dry salmon or a, a, a freeze dried salmon or a dry, a freeze dried krill or a frozen, you know, that's, that's a good one to look at side by side. You just take like a, a frozen krill and a freeze dried krill and put them side by side. You know, they could have come out of the same exact uh, batch of krill. It's just some of it was taken and put in a bag frozen and some of it was uh, put in a freeze dryer and dry. Gotcha. Um, what about guppies? What do you recommend for guppies? I mean, the, uh, the community formula flake that we make has been popular uh, with people that raise and keep guppies. You know, the guy that I uh, work with, Alec, he, uh, he does a lot of work with the aquarium societies and stuff like that. And right. one last time he told me that's what a lot of people are currently using for guppies. And that is the sort of fish that we have it, um, you know, for a community type smaller fish. And so the nutritional profile on that should be pretty good for a guppy. Um, but also supplementing with something like a spirulina flake uh, is good. Or you could even use the Formula 2. Is that Formula 2 for... Uh, marine because I know a lot of people use that for their big cichlids well the formula 2 is developed for marine fish so it has all the uh, the vitamins in there that a marine fish requires that he, that they can't synthesize on their own where those vitamins aren't necessarily required by freshwater fish so if you're feeding that to a freshwater fish they're probably not going to use some of the vitamins in there and it's just going to pass through their system and it gets removed when you do a water change or by your, uh, you know, carbon or other chemical uh, filter media. So somebody, since we're talking about um, vitamins, someone said they add vitamin C to their fish food they make. What do you think about that? Yeah, we put the vitamin C, the stabilized vitamin C in all of our fish foods. So uh, let's go to, oh, BB23 says, how much brine shrimp is in the flake Plus BBS. BB, I don't know what you mean by plus BBS. Is that, do you have a flake that's called brine shrimp flake plus BBS? No, it's brine shrimp flake. Uh, the brine shrimp plus flake. So how much brine shrimp is in the brine shrimp flake, I guess he's asking. Well, the brine shrimp, what it is, is there's, it's a brine shrimp plus flake because it's brine shrimp flake plus other flakes. Like any, um, ah. any flake that you see with uh, multicolored flakes in a jar, no matter what brand it is, usually each one of those different colored flakes has a slightly different composition to it. Like this one's got brown and red and green. Personally, I find the red one the most delicious. No, I'm just kidding. Um... Yeah, so most, people will grab a, most people will grab a pinch of the different flakes, you know, because you grab a pinch out of the jar. And then so when you take them and you just, uh, some people crush them up, some people feed a large flake. It really depends on the fish that you have in your tank. Right. And then that's just by, uh, you know, by the, uh, the way the law is written for the way products have to be labeled. It, you have to take and combine the ingredients from all the flakes by weight and then put them, list them on the label uh, like that. So, you know, the nutritional analysis is also all those flakes ground up together and uh, put on the label, which is why I think sometimes you'll see some brands of fish food that have different varieties. They'll actually have them separated inside the jar, and then that way they're able to list each one on the jar, like you might have a freeze drop. Your sound just went away. Did it? Hello? Yeah, now you're back. Okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you're back. Yeah, I got full internet right here. I, I can see it on my uh, thing, so <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's cutting out. Um, my buddy Papa Rhino, Ryan says, do you have any discus food? Oh yeah, we actually we make a really nice discus flake, and we make a really good uh, frozen discus food. You know, I've been told by a lot of uh, discus uh, breeders and keepers that. The discus go right for the uh, the discus flake. Sometimes with the frozen, it takes them a little bit to get used to it. It's a little bit different texture and whatnot. But usually after a couple of feedings or feeding it along with some other food that they're used to, they'll start to go after that because the uh, the frozen discus food does have blood worms in it, and as you know, that's a really good attractant for discus. Yeah, yeah the flake the flake's excellent. I mean, you can feed that discus flake as a staple to the discus. I'm pretty sure. 
you gave me the discus flake, and that's probably what I used first. Actually, all my guys liked all the flakes that you sent me. And I really like the community. I feed that upstairs to the angels. Right. All right. So are you going to be at the aquatic experience in October? We will be. We'll be at the aquatic experience. Um, and we generally have uh, different samples of food over there that we'll be handing out. Uh, mainly, it's usually like our pelleted foods, uh, some of the different wafers that we make, uh, maybe some of the beta foods. You know, they're going to have the, uh, the beta show over there this year. So we'll kind of beef up on a little of the, uh, the beta stuff as well. Okay. And wait, I just saw a question. Goldfish food. What do you have for goldfish food? Honestly, I think we uh, have recently discontinued the goldfish flake. Uh, it just wasn't selling. I, I think people use uh, pellets more with goldfish than they do flakes. If you wanted to feed a flake to goldfish, though, I would feed them the spirulina flake. I mean, if you like look this? At them, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would feed the spirulina flake to them. <clears throat> so, oh. Aquarium Thoughts asks, any floating pellets for a fish like an African butterfly fish? Uh, no, right now all of our pellets are a uh, soft, moist, slow-sinking pellet, but we are working on some different stuff. And, I mean, as you know, I sent you some uh, samples of some R&D uh, products, some smaller pellets and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I still have some. You sent me a lot. I still have some. Some of the bigger stuff, too. Yeah. So... What do you think of some of the other uh, uh, more designer brands of fish food? You know, the one from Canada. Oh, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I Ocean Nutrition, when it started out, started out as a specialty food. Um, it was only a frozen food, and it was used in San Diego Sea World back in the late seventies and early eighties for uh, raising uh, marine fish, basically for conditioning the brood stock of some. Uh, clownfish in different gobies and you know i think they were also trying to work with garibaldi's at the time and stuff and um so it was a really specialized niche product but then later on uh they started to branch out a little bit and they did have like the uh, the signature series foods back in the day the ad connings uh, frozen food and the jack watley discus food and stuff um uh but what happens with a lot of those foods is uh, they're a good food, but, um, you know, uh, you're using someone's name, so they get a royalty on everything that you uh, sell, and then as ingredients become more expensive and you want to continue to offer a high-quality food, uh, you can still make a good food without someone's name on it. Yeah, that's for sure. So my friend, the real king, uh, goes around the Northeast and shows his cichlids. Do you have a food to enhance their color? Oh, the Ocean Nutrition cichlid pellets really do enhance the color of fish. Uh, you know, it's a couple of the tanks I feed them on. Like I was telling you that I uh, take care of my brother's and my dad's aquariums for them. Uh, my dad in his office, we have a uh, African cichlid aquarium in there. And when I was at the uh, the NEC, which you were at also, yep. uh, I had recently redone the tank. And I picked up a bunch of, you know, the orchid guy that was selling all those baby cichlids. I went over there and just said, you know, here's Here's how much money I want to spend. Give me, and he gave me a really nice selection of cichlids. Um, probably a lot of stuff that you really shouldn't house together. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're do, they're, they're in together. There, uh, there's so many of them in the tank that they're getting along, and they're all eating the food, and they're growing really nice with some really good color. And then uh, on the other hand, my brother's tanks a uh, an embuna tank, and I've been feeding them the uh, the Ocean Nutrition uh, cichlid veggie pellets now for several or many years and uh you know his fish continue to have nice bright colors and they also continue to reproduce i mean i don't think we've added a fish in that tank in probably about 14 years but it's always full of fish and occasionally a big one dies which i think you know with embuna you're looking at what 12 to 14 years is an average lifespan on those guys anyway yeah so that's not bad no no I, i've had really good results you know with, with the foods um myself and like i said it's always easier to talk to people about a product when when you use it so that's right you know i've i've, I've used everything bay brand and everything ocean you know, at one point or another i mean you know i mean throughout my life i've fed thousands maybe you know a lot more than that of fish i mean uh, the first store i worked at had over 300 aquariums in it the second store i worked at had over 500 aquariums in it 
and I would wow. feed. And, and by the time I got to the second store, I was in charge of the fish in the fish room, and I would feed the fish uh, on average two to three times a day. Nice. So, Fishy Norway <laughs> says, Tetra discus bits, do you have something that work like that? I used your tropical wafer to my group, and they loved it bread like crazy. Um, we don't have anything like the bits currently, but like I said, with some of the stuff we've been working on, there may be uh, some new stuff coming out in the dry pellet uh, form type of stuff that would be appropriate for discus. Um, I don't know if I even, did I send you some of them other, uh, the discus food uh, was like a little red worm looking thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's some different things that where we're, and actually, you know, um, you know, Ocean Nutrition Europe makes the uh, the pellets and the wafers and stuff for us. So we just collaborate with them on a lot of different stuff. And uh, they've been doing a lot of the work, but they've gotten products out over there to a lot of breeders. And as you know, in you know, Europe, Germany and stuff, there are a lot of discus people. There sure are. Uh, so we're getting some questions about uh, like powdered food, like fry starter or something like that. Um, we had a... Uh, a starter food that was marketed for betas, a powdered food. And uh, currently we took it off the market in the U S that's not to say that the product won't come back at some time. It was a really good product. I think maybe one of the uh, problems was it was uh, marketed specifically towards betas because I've given it to a bunch of people that read Corey's and stuff like that. And they right. love the food. So there is a chance for stuff like that to come back. Yeah, I use uh, Fry Starter from Northfin. I also use my handy dandy pepper mill. Yep. Whatever pellet I use, I just put in there and grind it up. Fry food. Which you could do that with a flake, a pellet, anything like that would work as well. I've never tried it with a flake, but I'm going to get another pepper mill and try it. All right. You could even do it with a freeze dried food as well. So we haven't talked about San Francisco Bay brand. You want to tell us a little bit about that operation? Sure. I mean, actually, this year is San Francisco Bay brand's 50th anniversary. Um, and San Francisco Bay brand is a family owned and operated uh, second generation right now. And we are actually uh, we're in the process of uh, preparing some materials to put online that I think everyone will find interesting because Oftentimes we'll get comments because our uh, San Francisco Bay brand, we've got a number of single ingredient foods that are made in China. Really? Oh, we own and operate our own factory in China, which is unique to a U.S. frozen fish food manufacturer. So we have 100% control from once the, uh, you know, the uh, like blood worms or brine shrimp, cyclops, rotifer, moises shrimp. They get delivered to our factory in the morning and they're in the package and frozen before the end of the day. And we have a video coming out that's going to show the entire process from a drop off to when a container leaves for the port. Um, so I, I think people will find that interesting, and it really shows. And I mean, uh, you know, the facility is—it's uh, a really clean facility. It's a really nice facility. We built it from the ground up to our specs, so we could do everything the way we wanted to do it. Have you been there? I haven't. I've only seen it in videos and pictures. Uh, but it's run by our biologist who used to work at the office in Newark, California. And uh, he went to China. Uh-oh. He's never left the home of his family every now and then. So we've got a really good guy running that factory. So, you know. It's, that's, that's good. I love Cyclops for Guppy Fry. I've yeah. done a couple of videos on it, actually. Yeah, I've seen those. I've seen, and, and it is. The Cyclops have become uh, really popular. Uh, with freshwater fish keepers, you know, it used to be something that was uh, mainly used in the uh, the marine hobby and for reef tanks and stuff. But it's actually a very appropriate food for a lot of your freshwater fish because in the wild they're eating a lot of the uh, the copepods or uh, you know if you want to call them a freshwater plankton uh, stuff right, like right. That, swimming around in the uh, the lakes and rivers and streams. Um, and the same thing with mysid shrimp. I mean, there are a lot of small mysid species in you know in brackish. Uh, water estuaries and stuff that to the fresh water that fish will feed on um but yeah we've seen in both uh, with ocean nutrition and san francisco bay brand the uh, the frozen cyclops have become really popular amongst 
freshwater fish keepers. And, and it does make sense because you know, they don't maybe not have a super high nutritional value, but in the wild, fish are feeding on those things all day long. And so you don't want to have something that's got like a super high protein or a super high fat or it's going to take a long time for them to digest, something that's just going to you know, go through and give them what they need. And you can go on with your two, three or four feedings a day, depending on what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know how it is. It's going to vary how often you feed the fish. Some people feed once right. a day. If you have a lot of fish, if you're breeding fish, um, or if you're just really diligent with your maintenance and you're doing weekly water changes, you can get away with feeding the fish a little bit more. Yeah, that's right. So VB23 says, do you think pellet food is more concentrated and better than flake? Uh, no, because they're both uh, really done from a homogenous blend. You know, I mean, obviously a flake is a, a thinner, so, uh, it, you know, if something's eating a, a pellet, they've got to eat more flake to make up for the mass of the pellet. But again, that's going to depend on the type of fish you're feeding sometimes, uh, which type of food you choose to feed. But I've had, I mean, I think I had a, uh, what was it, I think a bleeding heart catcher that lived about 12 or 13 years and it ain't nothing but flake food. Wow. So Aquarium Thought. Thoughts as do we really need to thaw out frozen foods? And I don't always, bleh, hold on, I don't always thaw out frozen foods. Like if I have cubes, I just throw cubes in tanks. But if I have a flat pack, then yeah, I thaw them so I can distribute them more evenly. But right. do you have to thaw them? Absolutely not. A matter of fact, we recommend that you don't uh, thaw out the frozen cubes. You know, uh, because number one, uh, all the frozen food has some water added to it because you need to do what's called a glazing process and that the water in the food keeps it from uh, uh, getting freezer burn. It doesn't dehydrate or dry out. If you don't add water to the product, then it has no protection. And then so you're going to get that evaporation and wind up with the dry food. But there's absolutely, if a fish goes up and, um, you know, picks on a frozen cube, there's no harm to the fish at all. Um, and actually, it's probably in some ways safer because, as you know, if you take a food, put it out to thaw, and you forget about it, it's just like having beef or fish or chicken on your counter thawing. Uh, the warmer temperatures, the longer it's out, can compromise the, uh, the product. I mean, it's no different than anything like that. It is a raw uh, food, and it has no preservatives in it. But, you know, when you're doing a flat pack, most people are using a flat pack because they have a, a large amount of aquariums, and so they'll go ahead and they'll pour it out in a uh, container or a bucket and usually use like a turkey baste or something to go around and just squirt it into the uh, into the aquariums and whatnot i go through a flat pack i could go through a flat pack every day but I, usually two days in my yep. fish so let's see anthony who i believe is in california says I've been having a hard time finding San Francisco Bay brand frozen mini blood worms in his local stores. Is it online order only? It's not online order only, um, but it really just depends what the store chooses to bring in. Now, I will say this. If they do carry San Francisco Bay brand, they should be able to get that mini blood worm. And uh, I know the distributors out there do stock, at least a couple of them do stock the mini blood worm. And... Because the stores are purchasing through a distributor, they don't have to buy 20 of them. They can buy just one pack. So we should be able to get that product special ordered through a retail store. It is available online, but obviously online, there's that high shipping cost. So if you're not buying a ton of frozen food, it's not really, uh, you know, uh, worth the effort. Um, yeah. Going to the, uh, the local store and, um, you know, maybe, maybe even something that the local store is not even aware of. Uh, <coughs> Okay. Uh, so E, are you, yeah, ELR says, are you, is Ocean Nutrition doing any studies on which ingredients are best for fish? Um, you know, we've done studies over the years, and it's mainly just finding ingredients that meet the nutritional profiles, and you know how they're processed, and you know that they don't, um, you know, contain any harmful chemicals. Heavy. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out in the environment these days. And honestly, we don't even know what we're putting in our bodies every day. And I think that the pet food uh, industry is probably paying a little bit closer attention to a lot of this than the human consumable side is. I mean, you see how much, you know, foodborne illness you see in the news every day. Yeah. So, and that's why they came up with the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the Food the Modernization Act where everyone that's manufacturing 
human consumable and pet foods has to come into compliance with it, which because of stuff we've always done over the years, we were already a step ahead of the game on that by being a company that processes uh, beef heart in our factory. There was already a lot of things that we had to comply with uh, in order to be able to sell and ship our products uh, to other countries. You know, there's a lot of separation protocols, uh, the, the sterilization protocols, and we uh, we regularly go around and uh, you know swab our equipment throughout the day to check them for bacteria and stuff like that. So there, we do pay a lot of attention to that. But you know there are a lot of different ingredients we've looked at, studied. Um, we attend a lot of aquaculture conferences and stuff like that as well. And San Francisco Bay brand having been around for 50 years and actually was a, uh, a pioneer in aquaculture um, with the uh, brine shrimp and artemia assist. Um, it gave us kind of a, a leg up on a lot of that. We made a lot of good connections and got a lot of good information and our you know, original uh formulations which are still used to this day with the san francisco bay brand frozen foods were made in collaboration with some of those people and through aquaculture studies like especially the omega brine shrimp and stuff like that gerald wallace asks do any of your foods contain garlic uh yes we do put garlic in uh the formula two um we have garlic in seaweed garlic in a few of our frozen foods, but we put the garlic in there as an attractant. Right. You know, we right. don't put it in there to try and fight any kind of a disease or anything like that. Cause we actually, that is one thing we did kind of play around with in the lab for a while is just different levels of garlic in the Allison and stuff like that, that uh, supposedly will uh, kill ick. I mean, we had a little bit of luck when we were experimenting with some uh, iridescent sharks where the ick went away and whatnot without using anything else. But that could just be a fluke thing too. Maybe it got really hot up in the lab for a couple of days. Uh, right, right. You know, and we weren't we weren't convinced because we even uh, back in the uh, what nineties we experimented with enriching brine shrimp with garlic and stuff like that as well. Mmm, shrimp and garlic sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um. So VB twenty three says, if you had to pick one ocean nutrition food, what would it be? So if it was me, I would do the brine shrimp flake. What would you pick and why? Well, me, I would pick one of the cichlid foods because I'm feeding mainly cichlids. So. <laughs> I, I, I do use a lot of the um, uh, the cichlid veggie pellets. I, those are one of the ones I haven't tried yet, but now that I have a flower horn, I will. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do use a lot of those, um, but I also use the beta pellets and stuff um, and the spirulina flake. You know, feeding the cichlids, I'll, I'll uh, go back and forth with the spirulina flake and the, uh, the cichlid veggie pellets and stuff like that. And it's really going to depend. Like I said, I, I don't personally keep discus, but discus people that I talk to really like the discus flake. So it's, it's going to depend on what you keep. And I mean, if you had a variety of fish, then I would say the, uh, the community formula flake. So in the community, are there, is there like a little spirulina and a little, you know, what's in it? Oh, we've actually, I think we've got some of the veggie flakes and um, I think the Formula One and Formula Two and thing. But yeah, it's a, it's a variety just to give them what they need. So, uh, Fishy Norway says, do you have any shops in Norway? I would assume that Ocean Nutrition Europe yes, sells Ocean Norway now. Europe sells, uh, I know they have some stuff in Norway because um, uh, I've seen video, I believe, from some shops out there. With them. Oh, your sound went away again. Oh, is it back? No, now it's back. All right. Uh, let's see. So Fishy Norway also says, can you explain something about Huffa, H-U-F-A? I have no idea what that is. Do you? What's the omega-3 um, uh, fatty acids? Which we, we do a brine shrimp that, and that's more uh, going to be more necessary for the marine fish. You know, like when we develop the, uh, we've got two, like in the Bay brand, you've got the spirulina brine shrimp and the omega brine shrimp. The omega brine shrimp uh, has always been marketed for your marine fish, and the spirulina has been always marketed more towards the freshwater. Um, you know, it's just if you're feeding it to the freshwater with the high hoof level and they don't need it, it's going to pass through their system again. So it's something that's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary, but it's not harmful at the same time. ENF Singer, thank you for that ginormous 
two dollars and seventy nine cents Canadian, which is like fourteen cents American. Super chat. He wants to know what should I try for my rainbow fish? What kind of rainbow fish are they? But go ahead. Yeah, and no, I would uh, well, like you said, the uh, the brine shrimp uh, plus flake is a really good one for the rainbows, as well as the uh, community formula flake. Um, I mean, I used to keep a lot of rainbow fish, and I used to. I used to feed them a pretty good variety of stuff. I mean, I fed them spirulina flakes as well. Um, but yeah, I, I had a 55-gallon tank that had about 60 large rainbow fish in it. It was well, well uh, over-filtered. <laughs> I mean, they constantly bred and stuff. So, you know, it was uh, obviously good things happening in there. Yeah. All right. Well, Dan says, any coupons or mail order sample offers? Oh, well, uh, anyone that attends Aquatic Experience, we will have samples of food there for them, and uh, we can also answer questions when they visit the booth. Uh, there'll be a couple of us working at that show. That's going to be a good one. It will. I, I, I do think it's going to be really good in that location. So I noticed that on a lot of your flakes, one of the second or third ingredient is either gluten or wheat flour. Why? Yes. Well, that's really uh, necessary to make the flakes stick together and to give it some body, but we have been uh, working on some updated formulations, um, and we've actually, I believe, uh, removed the glutens and the flours, and so now it's also got a lower carb level of around, I think, only 14% carbs, which will uh, lead to less waste in the tank. That's always good. Yes. Yes, and it's, I know, you know, with the um, trials they've been doing back at the factory in the office, I mean, they do actually have to vacuum or uh, uh, siphon the bottoms of the tank less frequently now. Uh, so, you know, it is, and, and it's just, you know, a lot of that, um, the way feeds are made and stuff, a lot of that trickled down from aquaculture. And, you know, in aquaculture, they're just um, uh, really concerned about how many fish they can grow so fast to a certain size and make money. Right. They're not trying to do it for the long term and they're not trying to do it for water conditions, which is why also in aquaculture, they'll go around and throw probiotics in the pond to help eat up some of that waste that the fish are producing. Sure, sure. When you, when you have knowledge of the feeds, what you have to do is take that, make adjustments and apply it for, uh, you know, home aquarist uh, with the aquarium hobby and uh, breeders and stuff. So, um, but yeah, there, there are things that are necessary, you know, to make products uh, form and function the way they do. And sometimes that's just the way it is and there's nothing you can do about it. But I don't know, we've maybe done 500 plus trials on flakes to get where we are, which is not an uncommon thing with, uh, you've seen like a, uh, ever watched anything on how they make like gluten-free bread? You know, it's, not, it's not uncommon for them to have to do three to 500 trials to get a loaf of bread that will hold together and not fall apart. <laughs> so when will these gluten-free uh, flakes be available? Um, I'm not sure of the exact date because obviously we've got stuff that's already produced and in the market and whatnot. And uh, I think we may need to do another couple of trial runs on there. And uh, obviously we go ahead and we send stuff out for analyses to make sure that it's hit the targeted nutritional profile that we want to hit with the product well if you need someone to test I don't know. um so first i have to acknowledge a super chat from my girl liz she said i'm very sexy which of course i know thank you liz um, and then lumpy dog asks what recommendation for white cloud minnows they seem to prefer tiny high protein foods so I guess he means really small but high protein. Yeah, I mean, the only thing we have right now that's really small would be the flakes. I mean, even the uh, you know beta pellets may be a little bit too big for them. Um, but there are uh, some smaller things we've been working on, and so but yeah, you could you could take that grinder and like put some of the cichlid pellets, uh, the cichlid omni pellets through there, and that would give them a good high protein diet. Uh, but yeah, there are there are a lot of smaller fish being kept these days, so. That is an important thing uh, to be able to provide a smaller food for these fish. A lot of your danios and rasboras and even a lot of the popular tetras these days are a, a small fish. And also just the trend the hobby's going in with the uh, nano uh, tanks and stuff like that. Yep. 
So, uh, JH Aquatics, he says, I will be trick-or-treating your booth at the Aquatic Experience. I will come with a big empty bag. He's going to be the really tan guy because he lives in the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Me too. Uh, what would you recommend for a community with Cardinal Tetras, SB Resporas, and a couple of Epistogramma Cockatoides? Ah, I would probably feed a, a variety. Uh, you know, you want to use the uh, the community flakes, and then maybe supplement with either the uh, the cichlid flake or actually the uh, see the cichlid pellets. The small size would probably yeah. be fine if those uh, epistogramma are uh, you know larger epistogramma. I mean, obviously, if they're babies, they're not going to be able to eat the uh, the small pellet. But um, the difference being is I, you know, with those epistogrammas, a lot of time they're high, uh, hanging out well, mid-level towards the bottom of the tank as well. And those cichlid pellets are a slow sinking, soft, moist pellet. So that would be a, a good way to get food down to where they would possibly pick on it as well. Yeah, that can be hard sometimes with all that in the tank. It can, but you know, maybe if you give like some flakes and stuff, I mean, because cardinals are not super aggressive feeders. If you get their bellies nice and fat, you can probably sneak some food by them. Yep. So Penny Penny says, this is pretty specific. Any possibility of getting a guppy angel mix with black worms? Uh, angel probably, mix. Probably not. I mean, we're, it's really what we do with that is going to be just more towards a community mix. And we'd probably use blood worm over we would black worm uh, just because we have blood worms readily available to us. And we've actually, we've tried like in the past, you know, uh, like a frozen black worm and they just don't sell for some reason. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, shoot, I had a Tubifex is an option with stuff like that as well. I and mean, we do, uh, you know, uh, uh, do the, uh, in the San Francisco Bay brand, we do the uh, freeze dried Tubifex worms. Uh... Black soldier fly larvae, everyone's doing it now. Yeah. What do you think? It's good. I mean, we actually, back in 2001, 2004, uh, we had some. We were working with it at the time. Back then, it was just not a cost-effective ingredient to use in fish foods. Uh, when the black soldier flies first came uh, out on the market, they were actually being uh, used in the reptile industry at the time. And that was a time at which we were uh, making uh, some frozen reptile foods. And so we were experimenting with a lot of different stuff, but also crossing it over into some stuff with uh, fish foods as well. Um, it is a possible ingredient for us to use in the future, as well as other um, insect-based ingredients that we've been using for years and other products. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of good proteins. I mean, a lot of your insects out there on a dry weight basis have... Well, a 60 to 80 percent protein and you know uh, things like the black soldier fly have a uh, a high calcium content so if you're breeding fish you know it's probably a good thing to use um you know which is why like when we do our uh, beta spa which can be used when we're raising betas and stuff we include not only the uh, the almond leaf extracts in that but we also include the uh, salts and calcium in there as well um I was just reading 54 Punchy was telling a story. He had a bowl of live tube effects worms in the fridge and they rolled into a bowl of green jello. <laughs> he, has been, he has been able to eat jello, green jello since, and I don't blame you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I, when I worked in the uh, retail stores, uh, one of the guys, uh, 25 bucks worms, and uh, he did it. And he's still alive. <laughs> Um, so any other new products you can tell us about? Um, you know, I don't, this is the only new stuff we've come out with is towards the marine side of things right now. We did the uh, flat packs, but we do, um, we will have at some point a larger size in the pellet as well. That's something that's been requested from us for many years. And we've got a few other dried uh, products that we're in the process of working on. And it's just uh, to get them right. I mean, un unfortunately with this prominent as, um, the marine and reef hobby has been over the past few years. Uh, a lot of companies, including us, had our focus a lot more on developing products for that market. But, you know, we're getting back into uh, what, what obviously I mean, we've spent five years working on our flake foods where most of our flakes are geared towards the freshwater uh, 
you know, market. And so we're, you know, especially you know, we also saw that as being an important thing with, like I said, the popularity of the, uh, the nano aquariums, uh, you know, I mean, you got people out there now keeping, uh, you know, they, they look, if you look at it on Facebook, they look like these massive tanks, right? But it's like a 2.5 gallon ultimate nature, uh, aquarium, <laughs> you know? So they're keeping smaller tanks, so it's more important than ever to have a food that's not going to cause the fish to produce a lot of waste, especially when it's in a planted tank where nutrient control is an important thing. Yeah, for sure. You know, because well, a lot of people are doing 50, maybe 80% water changes on a weekly basis in planted aquariums. So this is a good question from Eury, Eury, I-U-R-Y, 1986. How can you tell in flake food if it's good ingredients? Now, we sort of talked about that, and you said you just sort of have to trust the manufacturer, right? There's yeah, no there's, other way. There's not really anything that can be put on the label. And, uh, you know, there's a regulatory body called AFCO, which regulates uh, pet feeds. And they tell you what you have to put on the label for specific things. You know, so... One guy might have a really good fish meal and one guy might have a not so good fish meal, but you both can only put fish meal on there. Um, now, they, you know, and there, there's different, um, sometimes what an item can be called is determined by the protein content in the ingredient or something like that, which in some ways doesn't really make sense because it's the same quality ingredient, but it's just got a lower protein where like, so we're using... You know, like fish meals and uh, the digest that have higher protein levels, and we actually have to be careful not to put in other high protein stuff because we have to make that mixture blend down the protein levels from like a seventy percent protein down to a fifty percent protein. Yeah. So you know, that's uh, it's. But yeah, they they um you know they tell you what you can what you can call things and what you can say, and we've even actually um you know fish food is a specialty uh, pet food, right? So a lot of things that are uh, thrown at us in that way are ingredients that can or cannot be used. And some of the information on why they can't be used is just based upon findings in cat and dog food. And then you have issues of, um, uh, you know, other countries. You get a product uh, from Europe, they can call ingredients totally different things. And so sometimes, it, you know, product uh, from another country might sound better but it's actually got the same exact ingredients it's just what a regulatory body allows uh, you know an ingredient to be called so it's it, it, yeah there's no really clear line the best thing to do is uh, go to a company's uh, website go to a company's social media or if they have YouTube channels see what kind of information they have up there um, you know see how forthcoming they are with information when you ask a question and, you know, like I said, with us uh, on our labels, we actually have additional information on the nutritional analysis, which is not required by law. Now, at some point, you know, I've heard that ash is going to be something that's required by law. But as far as I know, uh, phosphate is still not required by law. But since I think the mid to late 90s, we've been putting ash and phosphate on the fish foods. Yeah, <clears throat> I've talked to many people about ash and I don't really think about it until I look and I see it's really high, and then I look at yours and see it's really low. So, and that's got to do with the uh, you know the fish meals and ingredients that we're using. We use really high ingredients. I mean, I do occasionally see a comment that our foods are a little bit more expensive than other foods on some of the other foods on the market. But if you want a high quality food with high quality ingredients, it's going to be more expensive. Just like if you go and buy organic fruits and vegetables at the market. That's true. So Bob Kaler's fish hobby has a really good question. We all talk about how our fish dislike, like or dislike a food. Do you, does Ocean Nutrition keep in mind the taste other than possibly using garlic? Is taste a serious consideration when developing food? Um, it is. And some of the ingredients we choose, we choose because they're known to be natural attractants to fish as well. Um, you know, we use, if you notice, a lot of our formulations also have, you know, they have plankton, they have brine shrimp, they have squid, they have mussel. And those are all items that have really high attractants to them. Um, the thing is, it seems that with your herbivorous fish, garlic seems to be a really good attractant. And, you know, what I can say to kind of uh, speak on that behalf is 
San Francisco Bay brand makes a green uh, seaweed, okay? And Ocean Nutrition makes a green seaweed. The difference is Ocean Nutrition's green seaweed has a garlic extract that is in the seaweed. And I've talked to many people that have come up and said, you know, my fish won't eat this seaweed. And they point at the San Francisco Bay brand seaweed and they pick up the Ocean Nutrition one and say, but my fish love this. What's the difference? And the only difference is the garlic. Gotcha. So do you want a personal question or a fishy food question? Doesn't matter. Mob Guppy says, I'm thinking of shaving my head. Tell me your routine. <laughs> so mine is, and I haven't, I'm, I'm lazy this week, but I shave in the shower with a regular razor blade and I use a shave. Um, it's like a, a gel, but you know, you put a little bit in your hand and, it, and then, and then shave away. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't take it down to the skin. You know, I just use the, uh, the electric uh, razor. Oh, so you cheat. I, I cheat, but you know, I, I I still have hope. I got a little stubble up there, and I'm like, maybe if I rub some fertilizer in or something, you know, <laughs> something might happen someday. So if I let my hair grow, like like this area right here would be as long as it is now, and then this would be like you know this after a couple of weeks. Yeah, I tried. My kids were like, "Daddy, Daddy, let your hair grow," and I tried it, but then I looked like I belonged on a wanted poster, so it came right back off. <laughs> Well, this is because Lucas, my six-year-old, wants me to grow my beard down to my knees like a bus driver he had. Oh, yeah, and then you can braid it, too. Yeah. yeah. All right. Back to fishy questions. Okay. What do you think of dry Daphnia as a supplement next to other dry food? Oh, yeah, dry, uh, Daphnia is an excellent food. We, um, we used to sell a frozen Daphnia, but um, I don't think it's as popular in the U.S. as a frozen food. Or is even like a freeze-dried food. Uh, we do use it in as ingredients in several formulations. Uh, live Daphnia just seems to be more popular in this country. But then over in Europe, Daphnia is a very popular food item. Okay. So, and it's not, it, you know, it's a natural thing. It's similar to your copepods and stuff. I mean, it's something that fish are going to naturally feed upon in the wild. So that alone, by using that, if you have finicky feeders and stuff, just seeing a shape that's familiar sometimes can trigger a fish's instinctive feeding behavior um hold on i had another good question oh i don't know if you're going to answer this but i'm going to ask it anyway because that's how <laughs> i really is there a popular brand of food you would advise not to use uh probably not <laughs> probably not advise men not to use <laughs> or there isn't one yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I use, uh, you know, I've used a lot of different brands over the years. And uh, but as far as stuff that's popular now, there's a lot of it I have not used because obviously I've got a lot of uh, fish food at my disposal and it benefits me to use what I'm selling that way. Like I said before, I can honestly talk about the product and answer people's questions. And, you know, I've got plenty of fish. Uh, in my family's aquariums around me that have been feeding on these foods for many years besides fish I've kept for myself. So I'm just, I'm confident with the product and I don't see a need to. Plus, you know, I have two brands I can use. I've got Ocean Nutrition and I've got San Francisco Bay brand. And yeah. the San Francisco Bay brand is the, uh, the oldest frozen fish food on the U.S. market, you know? Yeah. So, you know, like when we met at NEC, we talked a little bit about me and you and food and I've had plenty of companies offer to send me samples. The first thing I say is I'm going to be honest. If I like it, I'm going to say I like it. If I don't like it, I'm going to say I don't like it. And half of them don't ever send me food. So I guess they're not that confident. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and, and, you know, also I think what happened was we were at the NEC and I just said, well, do you just want to try some? It wasn't even so much uh, hair, go do a review or anything like that. It's just, uh, yeah. You came by, you did a video. I had seen you sitting over there at the uh, the table all week with your guppies, and so I knew you had fish, and I'm like, you know, try it out. Just let me know what you think. It wasn't even, uh, you know, and then it just, uh, by doing that, it kind of led up to what we're doing now. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, like, I like testing stuff because, you know, I'm in QA for real, so it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Anyway. So Mob Guppy says, I think smell would be more important ingredient in fish food. Is that assumption correct? 
Right. It is the scent. It's the scent from the foods that attract the, uh, the fish to it. And the scent travels through the water. And you can see that um, by the reaction of a lot of fish a lot of times when the fish is put into the water. Sometimes you see it a little more quickly with a, a, a frozen food because it kind of starts to melt and you see those juices start to come off it. And once those juices get in the water, like I was in a local store the other day that a friend of mine owns and I took over some frozen uh, food that we're doing in R and D right now. And I put it in the tank and I just sat there and watched and you could see the fish that never ate this food before or anything. All of a sudden they start to get closer and closer to it and they're hovering around it and circling it. So you know that they were picking up on that, that scent from the food. Now, uh, you know, yeah, when you're talking flavor, I mean, how do we really know the fish like the way something tastes that they tell us, you know? And, you know, if we taste the food, it's not going to taste good to us if it may taste to them. But I think with that, the more important thing is the palatability of the food. You know, I, I just notice in general, like if you take a pellet, for instance, uh, fish seem to go more for those soft, moist pellets because it's a softer food. You know, they're not in the wild eating rocks and stuff like that so that's why right. a lot of times when you feed a hotter pellet they might spit it out suck it back in spit it out suck it back in or even some fish will wait for it to get a little bit soft in the aquarium water so yeah, yeah it's the scent and the uh, the palatability that are more important than the uh, than the flavor um and who knows maybe fish don't even like the way their food tastes you know yeah we don't even know if they have big taste yeah I mean, especially since a lot of times, you know, you got uh, predatory fish and stuff, they're attracted by motion and color and different things. And so that doesn't necessarily translate to something that tastes good. It just translates to, I got to fill my belly up so I can keep swimming. Right, right. So uh, what are you doing on September 13th through 15th? 13th through 16th? 14th through 16th? Sept um, is that Macna? No, that's... Uh, oh, the Keystone Flash? Keystone Clash, yeah. Yeah, we just got overbooked with shows this year. You know, as a matter of fact, what you just had Aqua Shell of that just passed. Yeah. No matter how bad we wanted to go to that show, all our trade show boots were sent out to other shows. We would have been sitting there with nothing. <laughs> you know, and because it, it was kind of a last minute thing too, so it wasn't in the yearly schedule. So yeah, it's some, uh, but that is something that we've talked to the people, the Keystone Clash, um, the big fish deal. There were more freshwater. Um, larger freshwater events starting to uh, to pop up, which is a good thing. That, that's what's really good about the uh, aquatic experience because the majority of the shows I do are marine and reef-related uh, shows, but you do see a few of those starting to incorporate some freshwater stuff now. Um, but, you know, besides the reef and marine, before you had aquatic experience, we had the NEC, which was the bigger uh, freshwater show. Right. Are you doing the NEC next year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I only live about an hour from where they hold that show, so it's not really a, a big deal for us to go up there and do it. Yeah. You know? But I, I enjoy that show because you got, like, a lot of the uh, – it's not only just the uh, the gathering of all the clubs, but you've got a lot of the uh, people that are uh, been in the hobby a long time, the old-time writers from the magazines and stuff like that go there. And so, you know, it's just, like, a lot of real uh, good, geeky, freshwater stuff. All right. Well, fishy folks, my time is up. It's almost my bedtime. And uh, I told Jason we we're going to talk for about an hour. So thanks for hanging out. Jason, don't go anywhere. And uh, don't forget to check out michaelsprescription.com and share and like this video. And then go, uh, go to Amazon or go to your local fish store and buy Ocean Nutrition Food. San Francisco Bay brand frozen food and uh, everyone have a great day. All right.